Butala, you here? Hi. Hi. Yes. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can see you and hear you. Okay, that's great. So, so I think we'll start the panel and the, the discussion. Hey, Dr. Butala. Hello. Okay, and I'll let, uh, so hi everybody. I'm Dr. Anita Kumari here. I'm a hematology oncologist. I work in Valley Medical Center as well as uh, AIM Specialty Health as a medical director. I have with me uh, do Dr. Nidhi Gupta, who's gonna introduce herself as well as some of the panelists and I'll, uh, Nidhi, take it over. Thank you. Sure. Hi everyone. Um, my name is Nidhi Gupta. I'm an internist by training. And um, right now I'm not seeing any patients because that's the outpatient part of my practice. But uh, I do do some uh, work as a medical director at United Healthcare. So we have an interesting panel here today. Some of, some of you are brand new to our talk, to our discussion. Um, so I'll just read out the names and if you can just give a brief introduction, that would be great. I think we have, starting with uh, Dr. Bitala, Dr. Nitin Bitala. Yeah, hi, I'm uh, Nitin Butala. I'm a neurologist and neurophysiologist. I'm based in Jacksonville, Florida, and I work with Baptist Health System. I'm mostly uh, outpatient, uh, and uh, I also do occasional uh, hospital. Um, that's it. Welcome, welcome. And I think we have Dr. Supriya Thiru. Hi, everyone. My name is Supriya Thiru. I'm a neurologist. I'm practicing in Plano in the Dallas Fort Worth area in Texas. And I'm a neurophysiologist as well. And uh, mm. uh, something happened to my video. Oh, we can see you. Okay, you can see me. Okay. Yes. All right. So yeah, basically, I practice in Plano, been in practice for 10 years. And uh, well, thank you for inviting me. Happy to be on this panel. Welcome aboard. Uh, we have Dr. Prashant Krishnamohan from Stanford. Hi, I'm Prashant. I'm a, I'm a neurointensivist. I'm a stroke doc. I uh, practice at Stanford here in the Bay Area. Mostly Welcome patients. again. Yes, thank you. We have Dr. Anurag Arora. Hi, uh, my name is uh, Anurag. I'm a radiology trained in pediatrics and emergency radiology practicing in University of Tennessee and St. Jude <laughs> Children's Research Hospital. Welcome again, Anurag. Thanks for joining. Thank and I think we also have Dr. Sham Subramaniam. Yes, looks like he might Has be. he joined yet? Yeah, he hasn't. So we will introduce them once he's here. All right. Well, uh, welcome to all. We are here to talk a little bit more about COVID-19 if you haven't exhausted all your talks on that. Um, one thing what we have, what I can say about COVID-19 personally is, is it's, it's still unpredictable. I mean, we still are learning about new symptoms. There's still um, new outcomes of previously tried treatments new treatments being tried. So even as, as much as I would like to say, I, I think we got a hold of, you know, what it is, how it presents and what we need to do, we still feel very, you know, um, kind of helpless in terms of gauging what to do with the virus. So this week, we, I think our focus is a little bit more on the neurological presentation of the virus. There's a couple of uh, articles that came, came out in NEJM. Um, Yes, one was from the French and one from the Chinese studies regarding uh, the Envoy type of presentation and a few patients from Italy. So, um, Dr. Supriya, what could, you, what could you tell us about the neurological symptoms um, that we're seeing in these COVID patients? Sure, sure. So let me talk about the presentation, the, the wide neurological presentation of COVID infection. Okay. And um, I think you are right about being very unclear. There's a very variable presentation. And uh, we have kind of limited experience too with the COVID patients. Um, so I'm going to go over some literature from different countries, some papers as to what kind of presentation we've seen in different patients in different countries. Um, I'm going to share a few slides. Um, 
Hope you're all able to see this. Can you all see the slides? Yes. Okay. All right. So I'm going to move on. Um, let me make it full screen. All right. So this slide here actually shows the mode of entry of the COVID infection into the nervous system. Can you, um, there are, can you make it a slideshow? Uh, slideshow, sure. Let, Is that better? Can you enlarge it? Can you enlarge it? Not sure if I can make it larger than this. It's, it's, That's fine. Can you read it? Uh, yes. Yes. You can. Okay. All right. So if you look at this slide, this kind of shows the mode of entry into the nervous system. So we think there could be two potential routes, with the most commonest route being the hematogenous route. So which means the virus enters through the nasopharyngeal system enters through the respiratory system, then it goes to the alveoli, goes into the circulation, and then that's gonna be a hematogenous spread. Eventually it in enters the brain. The second type of spread, which is not very common, um, but I think this could be one of the earliest presentation for patients. We see that it actually um, infiltrates via the cribriform plate over here. It reaches the olfactory bulb, and that could be the reason why some patients have early anosmia, so they have the loss of taste and the loss of smell. And this could be an early symptom because it infiltrates directly through the cribriform fascia and enters um, the brain in this direction. But what we've seen from all the studies is that it just goes to the hematogenous root and then goes to the brain. And then this is a study uh, from Wuhan. This study, they looked at 214 patients that are admitted during that time frame. Uh, what they looked at is, people who had severe infection and compared it with people who had non-severe infection. So based on their study, out of the 214 patients, 41% of patients had severe presentation and 58.9% had non-severe presentation. And between the two, uh, what they found most likely was that the severe people, they were more likely to be older. Their mean age was 58.2 years. And they were also had more underlying disorders, more comorbidities. Mostly hypertension seemed to be the biggest factor amongst them. And also these patients with severe symptoms, they had fewer typical symptoms. So these are not the patients that, present, that presented with fever and cough, but these are rather patients that had, for example, either encephalopathy or they presented with seizures or they presented with weakness in extremities. So it was completely atypical. So it was not even suspected as the first condition. And the neurological symptoms appear to be more common in these patients who have the severe infection. So I think this kind of states um, that any patient, um, we, again, there's a variable presentation. So just based on fever and dry cough, we cannot eliminate the possibility of them having a neurological problem because it's a very high possibility that these patients with severe infection may have an associated neurological problem. And if you look at the neurological presentation as to what symptoms, what systems are affected, it can affect the central nervous system, the peripheral nervous system, and can also affect the skeletal muscle. With the central nervous system, the symptoms could be anything like dizziness, headaches, it can cause, cause impaired consciousness, causes cerebrovascular disease, and can also cause ataxia and seizures. That's what has been noted in these patients. With acute cerebrovascular disease, it could be either ischemic or hemorrhagic. And with the impact consciousness, they could be somnolent, they could have stupor and coma, or they could have confusion and delirium. With the peripheral nervous system, again, we talked about the anosmia and aquasia, which is the loss of taste, and also it may cause peripheral nerve pain, um, but not clearly identified yet. Skeletal muscular symptoms, uh, this, is, this was evidenced by increase in the creatine kinase level, increase in the lactate dehydrogenase levels. So it kind of tells us that it can affect multiple um, organ system, even within the neurological system. So the lab findings in these patients, most of these patients had findings of inflammation. So they had a lower lymphocyte count, they had lower platelet count, and they also had a high BUN, BUN level compared to the patients who did not have the CNS symptoms. The low lymphocyte count, we think it could be from immunosuppression, 
um, in these patients with COVID-19, especially in the patients with a severe subgroup. Um, in patients with peripheral nervous system in involvement, there was no major difference in the lab findings between the severe and the non-severe group. And then this is a table which kind of summarizes all the different neurological symptoms that we're seeing. So again, talking about the uh, central nervous system could be any of, could be something as simple as headache, but it could be as severe as an acute cerebrovascular disease, which could be ischemic or hemorrhagic. And with the peripheral nervous system, we talked about taste and smell, but there, there have also been a few reports of vision involvement, which were seen in both the severe and the non-severe cases. And then nerve pain, of course, and the skeletal muscle injury, which was noted. Um, this table here on the bottom shows the onset of symptoms to the hospital admission, the number of days, basically, the number of days. So most of these patients you can see presented within the first day or like within the third day, uh, there were some symptoms like impact consciousness and cerebrovascular disease, which could take almost up to nine to 10 days um, in the severe patients. And then um, most of the other peripheral nervous systems were nervous system symptoms were mostly seen early on during this during the illness. And then uh, we talked a little bit about Guillain-Barre. Um, so I wanted to bring up this study over here. Uh, this is a study from China. And this is interesting because Guillain-Barre generally it is thought of as a post-infectious etiology. So it's associated with many infections. We've identified with many viral infections like, Camp I mean, the bacterial would be Campylobacter jejuni, and the viral infections that we've seen in the past are Epstein-Barr virus, herpes virus, cytomegalovirus, and also has been reported with Zika virus in the past. So one patient, this patient, I just want to uh, say a little bit about this patient. This study was based on one patient, but it's interesting that the patient did not have any typical respiratory symptoms. So they did not have fever or cough. They presented with weakness in the legs and presented with severe fatigue, which progressed over one day. So in fact, for this patient, COVID infection was not suspected. The admission lab showed lymphocytopenia and thrombocytopenia. And on day number four, the patient underwent a spinal tap, which showed normal cell count and increased protein, which can be seen in patients with Guillain-Barre. And then day number five, the patient underwent an EMG and nerve conduction study, which showed distal latencies and absent f waves. So these are typical findings that we see in patients with acute Guillain-Barre especially when they have the demyelinating form of Guillain-Barre syndrome. So this patient was treated with IVIG, but on day eight after admission is when this person developed a respiratory symptom. They had a positive nasopharyngeal test, and then they were placed on iso uh, isolation, and then they received a combination of antiviral agents. So this I thought was interesting because um, the, time, the timing of the weakness and the Guillain-Barre syndrome was actually coinciding with the timing that they were diagnosed with COVID. And this we have not seen with uh, infections because generally it's a post-infectious profile and it appears about seven to 10 days after a viral infection. And there was another study where they found um, Guillain-Barre syndrome. They studied five patients who had Guillain-Barre syndrome. And the first symptom was for limb, lower limb weakness and paresthesias in four of these patients. In one patient, there was facial diplegia, and this was followed by ataxia and paresthesia. All these patients kind of progressed to have tetraparesis over a period of three to four days, and then three of them received mechanical ventilation. Overall, the duration between the onset of symptoms of COVID-19 and Guillain-Barre syndrome ranged from five to 10 days. And then this is a table of how these patients were treated. Um, so if you look at this column, we can see the average was five to seven days, and there were a couple of patients that were 10 days. All of them, all of, almost all of them developed tetraplegia. One had diplegia, this patient had tetraplegia. And then the CSF findings were all typical with Guillain-Barre syndrome. They also checked some uh, anti-gangliocide antibodies in these patients in three of them. And in all three of them, these are negative. So these are antibodies that we normally check in patients with Guillain-Barre. And especially there are two other components which we call bigger staph brainstem encephalitis. And there's another condition called Miller-Fisher syndrome. These two are considered variants of Guillain-Barre syndrome 
and they usually have the anti-ganglios and antibody positive. So they checked it in these patients, and interestingly, it was negative in all three patients that they tested, and two of the patients, it was negative. All of, the, all of these patients received IVIG for the Guillain-Barre syndrome, and um, I think in some of these patients, they also did MRI of the lumbar spine. This patient specifically showed enhancement of the caudal nerve roots, and then this patient also showed enhancement of the caudal nerve roots. But there were three other patients that were completely normal imaging study from the MRI. Um, the outcome of these patients, out of these five, two of these patients remained in the ICU and they received mechanical ventilation. Two of them were undergoing physical therapy because of the weakness and one was discharged and was able to walk independently. And then talking a little about seizures. So seizures, I think is a very common presentation. We've heard of patients presenting in the ER with seizures and having a COVID-19. The mechanism we think is probably from direct infiltration of the brain tissue, or it could be from toxins, or it could be from the inflammatory mediators by the brain. With some of the studies, we know there is a big inflammatory cascade. There is a cytokine storm. There is from interleukin-2, interleukin-6, 7, and 10, also tumor necrosis factor and the granulocyte stimulate, colony stimulating factor. So all of these, they think we could, it could possibly drive neuronal excitability by activating the glutamate receptors, and this could possibly play a role in the development of acute seizures. And then moving on to encephalopathy, there was a paper that came up with acute necrotizing encephalopathy. I will not talk much about this because I know we have a neurocritical care specialist and a radiologist, who will probably touch base on this, but we think it could occur in a subgroup of patients who have the cytokine storm syndrome. So this is gonna be the patients with a severe presentation. And most characteristically, it involves the thalamus, re um, it involves bilaterally multifocal lesions and the thalamus may or may not be involved. And it also involves some other areas like the brainstem and the cerebellum or the white matter bilaterally. So conclusion, um, basically, I think we have very few knowns and a lot of unknowns. So it's kind of like the tip of the iceberg. We just have very minimal um, information right now and data right now. Um, it's difficult, if not impossible, to predict any kind of diagnostic neurologic test, which can ascertain the high-risk COVID-19 patients who may have CNS manifestation. I think early differential diagnosis is important just based on all these studies, we've seen that a lot of patients do not have the typical symptoms, especially the Guillain-Barre patient. They may not even have the fever or the cough or the respiratory symptoms. And in future, I wish if we could have a biomarker in the spinal fluid or in the serum of these patients who have neurological symptoms, that would be ideal to diagnose the cases. Um, but in the end, I think we have a plethora of unknowns and there's a lot of scope for improvement in future with the data that we have. Thank you um, so much, yeah. Sure. So would you reflect on the, you know, the treatment part of the Guillain-Barre syndrome when we normally see it in, in other circumstances and in other post-viral infectious scenarios, um, the, how you treat that would, have you seen in your research in these papers I know the main treatment I did was IVIG. Is that parallel to how you normally right. see the Guillain-Barre syndrome in other post-infectious syndromes or is- Right, in other post-infectious syndromes, that's what we would treat with. It would be IVIG or plasma exchange. Right. So yeah, and again, it depends on the severity of the illness. There are some patients who do really well. Even with Guillain-Barre, it depends on whether they have a demyelinating component or primarily axonal component. Uh, with Patients who, have demyelin the patients who have the motor component or the axonal component seem to have more severe disease. And that's what we've seen with uh, the Miller-Fisher syndrome, which is an axonal variant, and also with Bicostav brainstem encephalitis, which is like a severe form. It's like a cousin of Guillain-Barre or autoimmune neuropathies. Um, so depending on the severity of the illness, they improve. There are some people who have permanent deficits too. Um, but that in relationship to COVID, I think, again, we have very limited data based on these five, the study with five patients 
they all received IVIG and but two of them were still on ventilators. As I was right. looking at your slide, they, they didn't have very good outcome with IVIG. I don't know if doc, uh, Dr. Prashant, have you noticed anything in your neurocritical ICU related to any neurological complications with COVID? No, I mean, if you look at that paper that came out of China and you know the uh, one or two other publications from France, most of the the most common presentation is fairly non-specific. You would see any patient with respiratory failure in the ICU. You know, most of them are going to have like altered mental status or encephalopathy, like this vague dizziness. Um, so it's it's nothing too um, uh, exciting. I think there are a few findings which are fairly. Um, Consistent uh, needs a little bit more looking into is the early loss of smell that a lot of these reports have published. The association with guillain barre it looks more than just incidental. I think there's a consistent pattern there. Um, and, and, but everything else that's on that list, like the ataxia and the strokes, the numbers are all like two out of 200, three out of 200 patients. So it's really hard to know what to make of it. In terms of what we see here, mostly it's really this non-specific kind of confusion, like sedation and cephalopathy. We've not seen really like Kian Barre or um, any any other kind of distinct clinical syndromes um, to um, speak about. These are all very non-specific uh, things we see in the ICU. I have a quick follow-up. Yeah, I've, I've seen one. Um, we had one case of uh, stroke, uh, which which was the presenting syndrome for, uh, and it was a very classic. Uh, left-sided hemiplegia, no cough, no fever. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I was actually looking at potentially doing like a, a, a case report, but looks like it is already well documented. I think uh, there is like six cases uh, in the literature, at least in one series, where the presenting uh, syndrome itself was an acute CBA. Uh, in this patient, fortunately, we had a positive exposure history. There was a family member um, so this was the father of uh, the, the index patient. Uh, and so that is the only reason we even got, he even got tested. And, uh, um, and, and so I, I think it is something to be aware of. And it is worrisome because if you sort of have a patient coming in through the ER with an acute CVA or with um, you know, an acute neurological syndrome, um, at least in places like New York or California or, uh, you know, where there's high prevalence now of community um, outbreaks, I think one needs to uh, potentially almost universally screen these patients because they may not manifest typical symptoms of um, uh, COVID-19 or any kind of viral illness for that matter. Right. Something to remember is like, you know, strokes are so common, you know, and there's a lot of asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic patients around in the community right now. Right. What we are seeing is a lot of association. We don't know truly, you know, if the COVID is causative of that stroke or not, right? Like there are things which is directly attributable to the stroke. There are things which sure. can be attributed to the immune response of the body to the COVID. Right. And there are things which can be, um, you know, uh, totally coincidental. Uh, sure. you know, and, and so regardless of, um, you know, whether COVID causes stroke or not, we treat like, and, and I think most hospitals do that, every acute stroke that comes in through the emergency EMS is kind of treated as a PUI, uh, just more for a, a provider kind of like, I, you know, a safety perspective. So we try to use kind of like universal PPE, almost like treating a COVID patient. Like, you know, if we go into a stroke alert, uh, we go in with the full like N95s, like all the uh, full thing until they are ruled out. Or unless we have like a very, very, very satisfactory screening, which again, it's hard to trust the screening because there's so much asymptomatic patients around. But I, I, if they don't have a good screening and if it's unknown, we always treat them as a PUI for the uh, most part. And, you know, again, the data on stroke and COVID is also kind of really difficult to interpret because a lot of these patients, when they're in the ICU, they go in and out of AFib all the time, and that's a big risk factor for stroke. These are patients who get hypotensive because they're in shock, and that's another big risk factor for stroke. So there are a lot of variables here, and many of these publications really don't correlate their uh, neurologic symptoms, not just stroke, any neurologic symptoms 
really well with like their imaging or their series of findings, right? Like the, the China paper just had a list of findings, but there's no real correlation with what they found on imaging or CSF. The Henry Ford paper about the uh, encephalitis, it's interesting, but again, they said they couldn't run the uh, COVID uh, testing on the CSF. They just did the nasopharyngeal swab. So is this truly an immune response? Is this truly like a para-infectious thing or is this truly a direct neuro uh, toxicity from this virus? We just don't know. Uh, we know from prior like the SARS, the original SARS-CoV-1 or in the Middle East respiratory virus, the virus was isolated, at least in lab um, mice and stuff, like the virus was isolated from brain specimens and CSF. So we know the coronavirus does have a tendency to get into the nervous system. Now, whether or not it truly is causing any pathologic problems or are these kind of like um, immune response, like, you know, we know there's cytokine release syndrome with the COVID patients, so is that a part of that? Like, I think we have more questions than we have answers at this point. Another uh, yeah. issue. That I mean, I think the only the only thing I would add to that is I think it, it, the the theme is certainly consistent with the prothrombotic state status that is being very well described now, both in the lungs as well as in other um, other organ systems. True. So I think you know probably for people taking care of these patients, I think have a low index of suspicion. I think that's sort of the bottom line. And the other thing that was consistently found in the original SARS infections was with the skeletal muscle injury, which was really interesting that we find a large um, percentage of skeletal muscle injury in uh, COVID-19. And at least based on the original SARS-CoV-1, when they biopsied these muscles, they found like a high instance of like vasculitis. So whether or not the strokes have a component of CNS vasculitis is another kind of uh, a possible mechanism. But again, I, I don't think any of these studies specifically looked at the vessel imaging or looked for vasculitis in particular um, in the CNS. Well, I also wanted to just quickly touch um, on the dis-executive syndrome that's been reported in some studies, mostly on discharged patients. And the reason I bring it up is because we also have a parallel uh, COVID survivor group where a lot of um, people who have recovered from the acute infection are describing a lot of neurological and psychological symptoms. Um, you know, do we, I mean, we also know that a lot of patients who have ARDS or multi-organ failure and are, are, you know, discharged from the ICU have sort of this, uh, this, uh, what do you call that, um, critical neuro, you know, this syndrome that's mm -hmm. from the critical illness. So do we know any difference in the percentage of the patients that are recovering from COVID experiencing that and, and versus the, our typical multi-organ failure patients discharged from the ICU? Is there any difference or is this pretty much, you know, still working? Yeah, I, I don't think we know enough to be honest. As you mentioned, like many patients who come out of ICU regardless of COVID with respiratory failure or intubated severe ARDS, there's quite a bit of literature that there's like long-term cognitive effects without any primary neurological injury, just from non-specific. Right right? And so are these patients truly like, is there any added component to COVID-19? We don't know. Um, the only thing we could argue is because of this early involvement of the smell and the olfactory nerve, the, the olfactory nerve basically ends in the bilateral frontal lobes, the inferior frontal lobes, which is kind of your executive center of the brain. So you could, I guess, hypothesize that maybe there's a little bit more of a frontal lobe involvement. Uh, the study from France, I believe, showed that when they did perfusion scanning of these patients on the brain, right. they did find like hypoperfusion of the bifrontal lobes. That's so th th there may be an association, which I, I don't think we know. We have conclusive like data one way or the other to say. Dr. Batala, do you have any experience in these uh, patients who are discharged later on follow up as an outpatient? You know, um, not the COVID patients, of course, but, you know, ICU, long ICU hospitalization and then persistent sort of cognitive or executive dysfunctions. Do you ever do functional MRIs in these patients follow up and, and what, what do you see any incidence of hypoperfusion in the temporal lobes? You know, I think as Dr. Prashant said, I think it's going to be multi-organ failure related. It could be their prolonged stay in the hospital deconditioning, you know, all those, like the amount of medications which they have received. But as far as I think functional MRIs, I, I, we are not doing any
functional MRIs at my institute. As far as COVID patients, we are probably in the beginning stage. It's too early to predict, like, you know, post infectious uh, complications. Uh, it's too early to say anything about that. I, I, I mean, if, whether it is going to relate, uh, whether it's going to cause any, like, you know, uh, autoimmune kind of, uh, uh, you know, response later on, you know, we, we don't know. We don't know. Dr. Anurag, did you have some uh, radio, radiology update for us today? I think you're on a mute. I actually wanted to add a couple of things uh -huh. to the first presentation. I don't know whether uh, you can hear, can you hear me? I, we can hear you. Okay, so I think going back to the uh, initial presentation by Dr. Uh, I think she did a good job. So uh, I actually have, uh, so we don't actually know exactly the, uh, at what point the, uh, the COVID-19 virus is entering the nervous system. Because, you know, we know that it's entering through the ACE receptor and the ACE receptor actually is present in lung tissue, heart tissues, uh, you know, renal tissues, the, the your smooth muscles, and also in the brain in the glial, uh, neuroglial cells. But, you know, whether it's, you know, there is a theory whether it's at what stage, whether it's going through the, through the blood uh, circulation route or it's going through the lymph route or it's going through the, uh, to the, uh, you know, cribri from plate to the, uh, you know, olfactory nerve route. So I think depending on the route, it probably will, once we establish that connection, it probably help us to understand the, uh, variety of sp the spectrum of the neurological symptoms. Because if it's coming from the blood, that means probably it's coming at a later stage as a multi, but by that time, probably the multi-organ failure ha already has set in. And then it has already disturbed the body's homeostasis. So you're gonna have probably more sick patients uh, with multiple you know, organ involvement and syst systemic manifestations. But you know, is there a possibility that the virus is going directly through the uh, olfactory nerve uh, cribriform plate and directly connecting to the brainstem. There are actually the Dr. Prashant's mentioned about the paper. They they did study this with previous uh, coronaviruses in mice population. My study actually they were able to in, infect with a low amount of inoculum, and they were uh, able to infect this mice. And they found that the virus was only present in the CNS but not in the lung specimens. So now you know initially when we had this news about this virus there were news there were like videos or, or news spreading that the patients are not able to breathe in spite of they're kind of losing their respiratory drive so there is actually an argument going on that whether these patients are primarily getting virus attacking their brain stem or the cardiorespiratory center which is causing them to have this acute really bad respiratory distress which is not responsive to any treatment so that that is kind of a leading argument. I mean, again, we are not able to prove it, but then, you know, about as far as the ACE uh, representation is going on, I think it pretty much can explain, like there, are, there is data about cardiac involvement in COVID patients. So uh, these patients are going to have this prothrombic states and uh, clot formation causing strokes. Sometimes the, if the vascular endothelium is affected, similarly in the heart, it can go, that can still affect, similarly affect the uh, blood vessels supplying the brain. So that can explain the possibility of bleeding uh, complications. So there is so much interconnected, but you know, we, we, I think by discussing the neurological manifestations, uh, there's actually one more point I wanted to bring on. The, there is a paper uh, which documents that the, the SARS, I mean the COVID, SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19 virus, spike protein has 10 to 20 uh, fold uh, affinity or more affinity to the ACE uh, receptor. So compared to the previous viruses. So that may also uh, hint towards the increased uh, or, or increased uh, percentage of fatality, you know, in this particular virus compared to the other viruses. So, you know, these, uh, this kind of, you know, differentiating uh, and then they, they were also able to, in that paper, they were also able to say that the spike protein structure is different. So there is also like, you know, theoretical consideration that once we identify the exact difference between the previous coronaviruses and this 
uh, coronavirus spike protein structure, they will they might might be able to develop some antibodies or uh, directly towards this particular virus uh, for the treatment perspective. So there are a lot of lot of uh, you know unknowns, as uh, Doctor uh, Thiru said. But I think we we are probably heading in the right direction. Um, I think the main important I mean, the, the, you know, the most important thing is once we, once we understand this a uh, little bit, you know, more uh, definitively like the neurological manifestations, or we can kind of tag them with COVID, it will help us to kind of create a, like a, um, like we, we, we'll be able to like divide these patients with, you know, predominant organ involvement. Like, so if somebody has neurological involvement, probably they should be probably, you know, at more risk of getting you know, um, respiratory failure and, or maybe having severe outcome from the COVID, you know, so it will probably help us to kind of divide these patients versus mild patients with mild symptoms. Uh, and I think mainly, I think it should be probably the clinicians who are taking care of these patients should know that, is it possible for these patients to primarily present with only neurological symptoms? Because right now it's, it's all about cough, uh, and respiratory problems and this, but can they present only with res uh, only with neurological symptoms and whether we need to test it like you know aggressively based on just based on neurological symptoms? I think that's what I wanted to do. Uh, Absolutely, you know, and that's and the important thing is, like Dr. Prashant said, the the incidence of neurological symptoms still is so low that we still don't know whether it's related to the virus or it's just a you know, something coexistence because of the high prevalence of the virus in the community. So we will see, hopefully more data will come out in, in the coming days. But in the interest of time, I would like to move on to Dr. Anurag Rora. I think he also has a little presentation for us with the radiology updates. We can't hear you, Dr. Rora, just in case if you're speaking. And Rora, Hi. We so I think you. you can see me now. Yeah. So um, the role of imaging is, um, as you can see, most patients present with uh, respiratory symptoms. So first is first first most common uh, imaging which we do is a radiograph. And radiographs are usually, as you can see in this image, that the radiograph is negative, but you see some findings on the comparative CT examination. So role of radiograph is limited for initial uh, testing, but it's important for follow-up and to uh, check the progression of the disease. And then these has progressed from A to B. You can see um, periphery, uh, patchy opacities in the periphery in both lungs. So the, at least 80% of, of times we see peripheral in, involvement by COVID infection and bilateral involvement. So usually th these are the typical findings. There could be a plethora of uh, atypical findings as well. So as we are on the, um, these are few CT images which, uh, you know, describing typical ground grass opacities seen in these pneumonias and bilaterally, peripherally, and most commonly in the posterior basal lobes. So these are all typical symptoms, but I, like I said, there are indeterminate and atypical uh, symptoms as well, or uh, clinical findings as well. And this is one case which I saw published uh, depicting neurological findings in COVID. So it, basically you can, See, it's one of the complication historically seen with other viruses as well, like uh, other influenza viruses. It's a, a complication leading to acute necrotizing encephalomyelitis and involvement of thalami and temporal lobes is basically what we usually see in this. 
only one case has been reported in the radiological literature right now, uh, indicating hemorrhage in temporal lobes and abnormal findings in bilateral temporal lobes. So other than these, I've come across plain encephalitis and infarcts as you know, presentation of COVID, but do we usually do um, imaging for that? No, not yet. In my institute, we haven't you know, come across or ordered neurological images for you know, patients who are suspected with neurological uh, findings and we, don't, we haven't yet ordered any MR imaging for that. So it's basically, uh, we have about 35 patients right now in our hospital. Most of them have respiratory symptoms. So that's my take on it. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, I think uh, with radiology advanced imaging, it also becomes an issue of then decontaminating the the area for another hour. Yeah, it, yeah, we, usually, we usually don't recommend um, CT unless there is the pretest probability is very high and the patient's radiographs are negative. So if radiographs are clear, pretest probability is high, PCR is positive, then we can do a CT and look for you know, finding which we could miss on radiograph. Right. Thank you so much. Um, uh, and I think Dr. Shyam Subramaniam is still with us. Dr. Shyam, are you still here? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, all right. I just wanted to, you know, since we talked last <clears throat> regarding the management of these patients in the ICU, there's, there's new uh, reports coming out of, out of Germany of delayed intubation of use of hyperbaric oxygen and in some reports of use of steroids at some point, you know, previously it was like no steroids and, and now it's like, yes, maybe at some point. What's uh, your take on that? Yeah. Yeah, no, I think uh, with regards to the delayed intubation, I think there's some, um, there's a lot going around, I think particularly and more so in social media about you know, that these patients don't need ventilatory support or need to delay their ventilatory support and things like that. And I think that this, that is probably, a, I think it was especially uh, intriguing to see, my, you know, Elon Musk of all people sort of <laughs> darting, you know, giving out medical advice on Twitter saying, you know, don't intubate or don't jump to intubation. I thought that was really funny, but um, but no, I think the, there is a tendency to make this a little more exotic than it really is. I think this is pretty much the typical viral pneumonia leading on to ARDS that we have been seeing. Yes, there is, a, there is a, some level of atypical features where early on they don't manifest uh, the typical uh, low compliance that we are used to seeing. Um, but I think the standard uh, measures that we typically use for viral pneumonias leading on to ARDS, meaning start with oxygen, use high flow oxygen, and uh, if you're doing that, make sure you have adequate precautions to minimize uh, dispersion of aerosols. That means um, keeping the flow rates preferably below 40, actually below 30, but definitely no more than 40 liters per minute, and using uh, filters on the valves to make sure that the dispersion doesn't take place. And then judicious use of uh, non-invasive ventilation, again, with the, the lowest incidence of dispersion aerosols has actually been seen. There was a good paper that came out showing comparisons of different things like nasal cannulas, face masks, and actually the best thing was the helmet um, that is connecting a, um, a, a, a BiPAP uh, device directly to the, the, the helmet that is worn around the patient with a good seal that had almost a 0% of uh, aerosol dispersion. So, uh, so to me, prior to intubation, if you had to sort of chalk out what the strategy would be, it would be uh, high flow oxygen um, and then moving on to BiPAP with the helmet and then of course the uh, intubating the patient. Uh, with regards to the steroid story, I, you're absolutely right. It is a very evolving story initially uh, the uh, surviving sepsis guidelines and uh, the SCCM uh, 
uh, sort of guidelines uh, put out some things about you know avoiding steroids being uh, with with the theoretical risk that it might actually uh, prolong viremia um, and then now I think there is a, at least some good data coming out about the benefits of uh, early um, steroid use. Uh, that is, so uh, there was always some level of consensus about very late ARDS steroid use, where always there has been, uh, you know, a survival benefit <laughs> in use of uh, uh, standard steroids in late ARDS in the, in the proliferative phase of the illness. But the, these studies are now in the pre-ARDS sort of pre-cytokine storm selected individuals with high levels of CRP, high levels of uh, LDH, uh, ferritin levels, whether along with tocilizumab, for example, um, we can blunt the immune response and the, and the um, uh, severity of the cytokine storm. So um, we have started uh, using it at our center quite judiciously. We don't obviously universally use it, but in certain cases where we feel the patient is starting to get into early cytokine storm. Uh, we would be uh, we would be using that like one milligram per kilogram of, of steroid. So I wouldn't say it's a blanket no, but you're right. It is a very evolving story, and I think one of those rare instances where we are sort of learning on the fly um, with this. So almost every week we seem to get some new information or something that helps us get a better understanding of what to do with these patients. Right, and, and along those lines, if these patients who get early steroids, if they do progress, would they be an appropriate candidate for Ectemra or not? You know, because that's another thing that has shown some definite promise in the treatment of this sort of the side oh, of- absolutely. Can, can I'm, I'm, I, yeah, I, I think the IL-6 to me has been the, I mean, I, even anecdotally, and and looking at the literature, those uh, those uh, the tocilizumab story, I think, is the most compelling. Of you know, we, the 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 antivirals have all been disappointing so far, but I think the most compelling story has been that of the IL six. There is very clear um, association between the, the um, IL six levels and uh, 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 incidence of ventilatory failure, and in two series that is that is the published series. The results have been quite dramatic, and uh, and my own experience has, has been matching that. We see almost a very clear temporal association between the time we started, and actually one of our patients, uh, you sort of had a rebound after the effect, first dose effect wore off, and then required a second dose, and that really seemed to help. And there's at least one study from China that shows that two doses are better than one. Uh, the four uh, people who didn't do well in that trial were all in the arm that had only one dose of uh, tocilizumab. So I think that's a, that's definitely a story that's going to only gain, um, you know, uh, gain more and more credence as we go along, I think. Much more so than the antiviral, um, uh, the antiviral story. And another trial that I was very uh, curious about, because it came out of China too, was inhaled nitric oxide, this mass general is doing, I don't know. Right. Mechanism is, you know, the way it acts is is very interesting because it it uh, works on that oxidative stress for the virus and the whole viral replication pathology that's described. I'm right. it's very safe too. It can be done. Right. Monitored. So why is that not being uh, picked up by others? Yeah, I th I think yeah I think I think you you bring up a very good point. Uh, Inhaled in nitric oxide is. It's it's interesting because of a couple of reasons. One is it actually uh, improves what many believe is one of the pathophysiologies uh, that are underlying this, which is the uh, severe degree of shunt and VQ mismatching both going on because of um, uh, sort of vasoconstriction to the good areas of the lung, and by giving nitric oxide, you could you could improve upon that. There's studies showing, you know, a lot of RV stunning and low uh, right ventricular output. Uh, that is because of uh, that. That it can also be improved by that. And then there's actually some data that nitric oxide may even have an antiviral effect itself. So there's multiple uh, avenues in which uh, inhaled NO could be helping. I think the numbers are so small that it hasn't yet made it into uh, the guidelines. I know, like, 
when I sort of compare uh, Yale and uh, UPenn's, uh, you know, their medical center guidelines to the one that BW put out, uh, Brigham and Women's is the only one that, at least to my knowledge, has a very clear pathway sort of laid out for this. Uh, I personally uh, haven't had uh, any experience yet. I, we haven't needed to use it, but I clearly would see this as being a very viable option. Most medical centers have access to NO. Exactly. And so certainly Quite before- Also very few, I mean, not much as compared to some of the other yeah. things later on. Certainly, in the yeah. So. Certainly before committing a patient to ECMO, I think this would be a very, uh, very valid um, option. Uh, the other thing would be, uh, you know, the use of, um, uh, you know, like prostacycline, um, analogs and you know uh, similar agents that we typically use for pulmonary hypertension. Whether those those have also been tried along the same lines as NO. But to your point, NO is is fairly uh, easy to obtain, and uh, and I think for the rightly selected patient, it could be it could have very good results. We have we have uh, the use of NO in other similar settings in ARDS is pretty well described and documented. So most hospitals should have a protocol in place for uh, you know, already. So this would be an easy one to tag on to. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Shyam. Uh, I'm just gonna ask two more questions going back to the neurological symptoms. And Dr. Prashant, can you help me with this? So what, uh, since you're doing neurocritical care, what is your threshold of assessing for like stroke or GBS or things like that? Are you guys in Stanford doing it or anywhere else you know of, uh, you know, where uh, you will start the imaging? Sorry, with... Anita, I, I, missed you. So, I missed the first part of your question. You kind of like... Sorry. Uh, so yeah. what would be your threshold of, uh, you know, kind of assessing the patients for, say, stroke or GBS or things like that? Are you guys doing it, uh, you know? In... No, I mean, I think GBS is going to be sort of a little bit easier for us to um, uh, uh, pull the trigger and evaluate because the presentation is going to be so distinct and, you know, the symptoms are going to be like very clear. In terms of stroke, you know, if it, if, as we mentioned, if the, if they have like symptoms very focal, like right at the onset or when they present to the ED, then that's easier. When it becomes hard is when they're like in severe respiratory failure on the vent in the ICU, and they're just kind of this non-specific confusion and like encephalopathy, and they want us to evaluate for strokes. That is when we are a little bit reluctant to kind of like send them down for imaging for a variety of reasons. One, their stability, and two, sending like a, a positive patient to the imaging. It all depends on the fetus uh, probability as we spoke. So that's where it gets a little bit kind of like um, muddied, and so. Usually in that phase, we are a little bit reluctant to obtain imaging. But for GBS, if they have like a good story where they're like out, the weakness is out of proportion to the degree of their respiratory failure and stuff, then I think we probably should. But again, we haven't seen patients like that fit that profile or we haven't made the diagnosis here uh, as far as I know in both the hospitals I go to. And what about like, in, is there any post-mortem studies uh, from like China or anywhere where they have just seen something neurological very common? Because yes, the challenges of testing a patient when they are in ICU with all the you know difficulties, it's very, it, it's kind of very challenging. But can they like, is there any post-mortem studies saying that okay, or looking into that, you know, they have been having strokes or things like that? Do we know anything like that? And, and not, would, that, uh, the, uh, would the management be any different? No, I mean, I'm not aware of at least postmortem studies for COVID-19. As I said, for the COVID-1 and Middle East respiratory virus, there were some postmortem or, you know, other kind of pathologic findings. Um, here, uh, I haven't seen any publication yet of postmortem findings specific to, like, the um, nervous system. So I don't know, um, to be honest, uh, whether it's going to have any treatment implications. It really depends on what we find. If we find like that this is secondary to like an early immune response, which is part of the cytokine release syndrome, or if there's a component of vasculitis, then we may rethink the use of you know things like early immunosuppression or tocilizumab and pulling the uh, trigger early on some of those agents. Um, uh, so it, it really depends. Yeah, I don't think we 
uh, I, I'm not aware of any postmortem studies. That would be a good, you know, kind of uh, study to see because uh, considering that even with the advent and everything, even with the best respiratory, uh, you know, support, they are still doing poorly. Is there any brainstem involvement, things like that, that, that a postmortem study, at least we can. Of course, yeah. The uh, one more question, actually, that was posted by, uh, and I will ask one of the neurologists to please take actually two questions. So uh, one is, uh, this was posted on one of my uh, COVID survivors. Uh, they wanted to know, and because they have survived uh, the COVID, they, they, they have a lot of non-specific neurological issues going on, uh, like uh, memory loss, uh, coordination issues. Uh, they wanted to uh, ask these questions like, uh, is there anything that we know of, the, you know, that uh, after post-COVID, is there any issues like memory or, uh, you know, that could affect the memory, that could affect, uh, I don't know, coordination? Is there anything like the varicella zoster that it can stay it can stay in um, the, you know, the nervous system and can reactivate later on. Do we know anything like that, Dr. Uh, Nathan or Dr. Supriya? Did you hear my question? Yes, I heard your question. So some of these symptoms, yes, could be involvement from the frontal lobe or the temporal lobe because that is involved with the memory and also with emotions. So there could be a presentation of psychiatric symptoms or an increased association of depression. Um, but I think it's too early because we don't have enough data on that to say that there is a direct relationship. Another thing is, um, it's important to mention that a lot of neurological symptoms and signs are probably, rela probably related to hypoxia. They're probably related to metabolic acidosis, respiratory acidosis. So they've probably sustained a degree of brain damage, which could also be causing those symptoms. So it's kind of really hard to differentiate and say that these symptoms are related to COVID. It could be just related to a generalized encephalopathy or encephalitis picture that they had. As far as the reactivation, so far we don't know. I mean, I think it's too early to comment on it um, because I think we need more linear and longitudinal data. So maybe that's something that we may be able to answer at the end of the year or like review of retrospective studies that's been done for like a longer time frame. Um, but basically, I think it's too early to comment on that. And uh, as Dr. Nitin was also saying, where it originated and how it is reaching is also going to be important because that, that would at least give us, okay, is it in the nerves? It's, it's going there. I, I, you know, so that's something uh, very interesting. Anyone has any questions that uh, anyone wants to ask? I, do I have a quick question for the neurologist. I know a couple of you mentioned that... Um, it might be affecting the olfactory lobe. Is that just a theoretical uh, belief or do we have evidence based on biopsy or, or functional MRIs or, or is that being theorized based on the symptoms of, of anosmia? So it's, it's mostly based on um, the symptom, the early onset of anosmia and what we know from other coronaviruses like in lab models, they did prove that because the um, they did prove that the virus can get into the CNS through the nose, like the cribriform plate. So I think it was just kind of uh, putting together like different pieces. I don't think we've had like a direct virus isolated, the COVID-19 isolated from CNS. From all these case reports, I think I've only seen one case report where like the CSF was positive for the viral genome, pretty much like no other uh, publication studies or case reports have actually been, uh, have shown that the virus just positive in the CSF. So we don't even know for a fact that this is actually in the CNS. It's really more uh, a hypothesis, basically. So Thank you. Another question I have, and I'm going to just wrap up after that. So uh, in SARS and MERS uh, infection, I'm sure, uh, I, I, I'm not, actually, I do not know if they do affect neurological. And if they do, do they present, like, uh, even later on, like chronic dementia? Like, uh, you know, is there more propensity to have dementia? Because we don't know about COVID, it has been with us for three, four months. But is there any data from the previous SARS or MERS, um, you know, that they could present more so later on? Most of the reports I've seen are all acute presentations. We haven't seen any long-term uh, cognitive effects from the previous SARS. It's all like in the acute setting, like this vasculitis, skeletal muscles, strokes, and things like that. 
it may be out there. I just haven't seen them. Thank you. Thank you so much. This was, I think this was a very good in discussion. Dr. Supra, do you have anything to add? Um, one thing that I wanted to add is I did read some paper about a postmortem study. Again, we don't have enough information on that, but all they found was some brain hyperemia, just brain increased vascularity. So I think it's a very non-specific finding. And I think, again, something to look for in future, because once we have more data, I think we can have an idea of which lobe it involves or which region of the brain it has a predilection for. Thank you. I wanted to add a couple of things, if I have a moment. Yes, please do. So I think going back to your question, uh, Anita, some of the COVID survivors, I, I think it will be interesting to know if they're experiencing neurological symptoms after the, you know, the COVID, uh, uh, you know, if they are recovering from the COVID and, and if they have not had any imaging done, I, I would recommend them to get the imaging done. Mm. If, if they're experiencing, you know, because it will be, because as, as our pulmonary colleague here, he said that they are not doing neurological you know, imaging on patients unless they have a high suspicion. Yes. So I, I would definitely recommend that they should have a neuroimaging performed to, to see if there is any structural uh, damage or not. And I will probably go one step ahead and probably do lumbar puncture because they, you know, there is also, somebody did ask this question, when to do the CSF studies, you know? I think I will do CSF studies in these patients if they are in spite of having surviving the COVID and uh, they're having neurological manifestations. And I'm I will go and do the CSF. Because I think I have few MD sur COVID survivors and I, you know, I'm very closely uh, kind of uh, asking their and understanding their symptoms and every one of them, um, more, more so, I would say five or six of them are actually saying the same thing, coordination issues, memory issues, and a lot of stress, that is part and parcel with it, but not having coordination issues like dropping off young, young, no comorbidities, that's something that is very concerning at this age, so is there some... Yeah, yeah. Again, some of the patients with peripheral nerve involvement, not everybody is going to present like clear-cut like Giyabare where they are going to have acute onset of, uh, you know, weakness. Now, some of them might present with, you know, this kind of sketchy distribution of weakness or coordination problems. And so I think, uh, you know, they should have a neurological workup if they have not done, uh, you know, during their stay in the hospital. Now, now coming back to the one of the other uh, questions which you had, you know, we know in pediatric po population after certain viral infections, or certain bacterial infections, you do see chronic kind of, uh, you know, uh, sequelae of those uh, infections. So okay. it's too early, but it will be interesting to know, you know, whether COVID has similar issues or not. And then one more thing which I wanted to add is, uh, we know from some of the previous viruses that some viruses actually do destabilize the atherosclerotic plaque. So we don't know whether COVID does that and whether that could be causing strokes. Interesting. Uh, right now, we don't know if, uh, you know, even the postmortem studies, we have not seen strokes to be common. Is that just something, uh, if it is from the emboli, probably, you know, but I, I don't know. I'm just trying to learn as much as everybody else. So. Yes, very interesting. Thank you so much, everybody. And uh, uh, Nidhi, do you have anything to add? I think, Dr. Sham, there's a question that's yes. posted, and I'll just read it out for you. I think it's from one of the hospitalists. Um, is how long do you defer intubation? And when, I mean, that's kind of tagged along to when do you decide that high flow oxygen is not helping, I guess? Yeah. Um, I, I think... Uh, it, it's 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 sort of uh, hard to hard to give any uh, you know very uh, stringent guidelines. I mean, obviously, this is a clinical decision. A couple of things that are specific to COVID. One is that uh, these patients deteriorate very quickly. So uh, early on, as you are making use of your serum markers, have have daily markers of uh, ferritin, D-dimer, CRP, LDH. Uh, IL-6 if, if it's available. We have that almost uh, in any patient who are at high risk or have high uh, elevated markers in the beginning. We track these very closely. These patients, what I've seen is they, and it's, it's consistent with what has also been described is 
they can deteriorate it very quickly. So have a low uh, threshold to uh, escalate care um, uh, for these patients. Um, I, I uh, have had a change in, uh, I've seen a change in sort of the guidelines initially about, I would say three weeks ago or a month ago, uh, there was this talk of very early intubation because of the risk of dispersion of aerosols and avoiding non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. I think a couple of things have happened. One is I think we have, there has been at least that one paper that showed that you have very minimal dispersion of aerosols with the use of the helmet uh, and, and CPAP or BiPAP use. And, uh, and also I think the shortage of ventilators um, has also prompted a rethink as to whether are we just uh, putting these patients too early. So certainly I think there is some merit to wait to at least uh, giving a trial of uh, BiPAP in the, in the right context. Obviously somebody is deteriorating very rapidly and uh, has you know, altered mental status and is not a, is not a good bi candidate for BiPAP then, or for non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. But, uh, but there, those are sort of the instances, but definitely not, I, I, you know, there is some, uh, some of my uh, uh, friends have talked about, you know, forwarded uh, things on social media about, you know, letting these patients be hypoxemic and, you know, intubation is not an answer for that and all that. I, that I would definitely st steer away from. Use standard clinical judgment about, you know, oxygen levels, work of breathing, um, how uh, sick the patient looks and then kind of make the decision on that. Thank you. I don't think we have any more questions in the chat, Anita. So if you I want to see Dr. Nitin, who, uh, who, Dr. Dr. Nitin, do you have any question or anything else to share? I see. I just want to a uh, couple of things. Uh, I don't know how many people here are uh, general medicine or outpatient uh, clinic doctors, or I just wanted to let them know that. Uh, you know, as far as neurological patients are concerned, uh, there are disease-specific organizations, like for example, Muscular Dystrophy Association, Myasthenia Gravis Foundation, Multiple Sclerosis Society, you know, Stroke Association. All of them actually do have uh, really uh, good resources on what to do, what not to do for these patients. So if any of them have any questions, please, uh, refer to those uh, uh, DC specific uh, society websites and uh, they really have valuable information and they keep on changing. I think they came up with a really nice paper for myasthenia gravis patients and uh, they also have a good information about multiple sclerosis patients. So, uh, and of course, uh, all other neurological conditions. Uh, I just wanted to make people aware of that, those resources. Thank you so much. Uh, Nidhi, thank you so much. I think uh, we'll wrap up here. This was a great uh, discussion and uh, really, really, uh, really uh, had a good time talking to all of you. Thank you so much, panelists, and thank you so much, Nidhi. We'll see each other next time. Uh, thank you. Bye-bye.